Um, she is the chair currently of the top sector life sciences and health. I have to read this, sorry. Um, but she also has an extensive experience in industry uh, with both uh, big enterprises at Philips, but also small huh, as a startup. Um, at Eindhoven University, she is the, the chair of MTIC, which is our big collaboration program. Maybe she will explain about that. Um, and as such, she has a, an important role in setting up public-private partnerships. So with this, um, I would like to invite Carmen to the stage. Well, thank you, Martin, very much for your kind introduction. And also very much welcome, of course, on behalf of me on this very first MedTech Day on the Eindhoven University of Technology. Uh, I was also asked to put this in a little bit broader perspective eh, with my national role on, as Martin already uh, introduced. And uh, the top sector, very brief about that, is being established by uh, the government uh, after the financial crisis to stimulate innovation in the Netherlands. And uh, that's been turning on quite successful. There's been 10 top sectors, but a couple of years ago it is ev uh, evaluated and it said, well, it's nice to have this innovation uh, and also economic um, advantages, but it's also good these top sectors can also work to work on our societal challenges. As so our the Rutte 3, our last cabinet has um, uh, defined four uh, societal challenges, which you can see here, and care and health and care is one of them. And we have a number of long-term missions, you could say moonshots, uh, that uh, are defined as a kind of uh, goal for the Netherlands in 2040. And for health and care, it is that we, our ambition is that in 2040, people, now I have to walk back, I can see it here. Um, people, we, we want to have all our, our Dutch people to live five years longer in good health. So not only live longer, but live longer in good health. And the most difficult part of the mission is that the inequalities in that ambition between high and low social cl uh, classes have been reduced by 30%. So right now, who knows who's the, what's the, the average uh, life expectation difference between high and low social class? Does somebody know? Probably you, you do know how much? Seven years. Seven years. So we reduce that by 30%. Uh, and we also know that in COVID time it has not been reduced, it has been increased. And you see MedTech eh, is playing a role in all these four sub missions that have been defined. The first sub mission is about prevention, the second one is about uh, taking care at every place, the third one is about chronic diseases, and the last one is people with dementia. We know in 2040 dementia will not be solved, so it's very much about early detection and uh, increased quality of life of people. And I will give a few examples eh, next to what we will have today, because there are many technologies uh, dem um, presented today. I will, s I will show a couple of other examples of medical technology in these four domains. The, 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 the golden uh, triangle is also part of what we call the quadruple helix. You can say it's a kind of square around it. Eh? So we talk the missions, we very much involve per, uh, patients, but also citizens in combination with industry, in combination with science, and in combination with governments. Eh? So public-private partnerships, we still talk about that, but then we include also the, um, uh, the citizens and the patients uh, into that. So you could say it's a kind of um, uh, square around the, the, the golden triangle, but don't worry, I will show also one of the golden triangle <laughs> exa examples, uh, Martin. And um, well, I also mentioned prevention. Uh, it's good to be aware that the, uh, the extended life expectation of people in the last uh, 150 years is about 40 years. And you see here, uh, about 100 years ago, you need Photoshop to put five generations into one picture. And now, well, cost a little bit of effort and it's not perhaps for everybody as convenient, but we can, we can have five generations in one picture without Photoshop. But it's not about, med that's not caused by medical uh, technology or about medical knowledge so much. It's only 15% of this uh, extended life uh, time. The most important things has been things like uh, hygiene, hygiene, clean water, social laws, better work uh, as, um, uh, circumstances and so on, education. So medical technology and medical knowledge has only been cost 15% of the extension of the, uh, of the life expectation. 
Well, this has been quite slow. Sometimes technology is moving faster. You see here two different Pope integrations. That's only a couple of years in between. I think it's been uh, about eight years, and you show completely different picture, completely different experience because of technology. But still, behavior doesn't change so fast. So that was about uh, prevention. Uh, an example about uh, availability of care. This is the, the development of a, of a, a carable uh, um, uh, neo kidney. Yeah? So people that, that has uh, kidney problems, they go to the hospital right now for dialysis. And the Kidney uh, Foundation, with a large public-private partnership, has been working quite a number of years already about doing that anywhere. They started with a kind of belt, but then the patient said, "Well, that's a little bit stigmatic. I don't want to be shown as a belt." So they changed the concept into a mobile concept that you can use literally everywhere. And then, of course, we all know, and also Eindhoven is quite active in that, the next step will be regenerative medicine to stimulate the body to heal itself. Well, availability of care is also one of the big topics in MTIC, which is uh, the, the second session of today. And MTIC is the Eindhoven Medic Innovation Center. It's, it's basically the continuation of very long-term bilateral and trilateral collaboration in a partnership of five, exactly as yes, we've been told, industry, uh, the university, and, and, and the clinics. And it's also scientifically shown that the success of this kind of collaboration is, is dependent of the excel, uh, excellence of the partners, but also of proximity. Yeah, and we, we, we always talk about the bike distance of this, all these partners. And it's literally the case that our PhDs, but also the employees who work in this, uh, in this ecosystem, are in the morning at the TU, in the, in the, in the afternoon at the Katharina or whatever, and in the evening we have a pizza sessie at Philips. Um, the mission of MTIC is to fast track clinical innovation by value-based healthcare. So value um, uh, innovations that add value for the uh, patient and, and speed it up. And it's really a big ecosystem, it's still growing, and it will, uh, it's uh, about 100 PhD right now. And one of the biggest things is oh, that we are educating our talent. Eh? We all need that this, uh, the healthcare is changing quite a lot with all kind of technology, with more patient-centric. And the PhDs in our ecosystem are used to work from all kinds of different angles, look into the problem from an industry point of view, from a patient point of view, and from a science point of view. So there's the triangle again, uh, Martin, uh, so don't worry. One of the examples is remote monitoring. The health dot is one of the examples where you can people, uh, um, uh, after a uh, surgery, let go home much more earlier, but in a safe way, monitor them at home. Uh, this is uh, another example here from our university. We have a quite a number of student teams, and one of the student teams is also working on, on uh, uh, for um, people with chronic disease. They're trying to translate people that are, uh, have difficulties with uh, communication into tactic feeling. So it's very nice to see our students teams around. We all, and it's, it's a little bit pity. We all know our, our mobile st student teams here with, uh, with Lightyear, but there are also very much uh, 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 medical student teams, and it's, it's, it's not so easy to bring it into the market, but you will see in the future much more from our student teams here at the TU as well. Well, people with chronic disease, we all know had the topics around, uh, around uh, interventional, cardiovascular, oncology, I think that will come today much more broader also uh, in, in, in the sessions. And AI, of course, is playing an increasing, uh, increasingly big role into that. Last example I want to show is uh, for people with dementia. That's also one of the groups here at the university. So I'm, okay, I'm going from the Netherlands now uh, to the university back before I will introduce the next session. People with dementia, this is one of the developments of, uh, of also one of her professors. This is a home compost really de developed from the thinking from the person. Eh? So, you know, all kind of GPS solutions. That's all, for, that's all to help others eh? to find somebody with early dementia back. This is for a, people with, with, for a person with dementia. There's only one arrow on this product and that always pointed towards home. Very easy product, very easy concepts, and it's really uh, thinking from the person, the patient itself. Well, I think that's what I wanted to tell you as an introduction for this really nice day. I'm, le I'm really looking forward. I already congratulate Mar Martin uh, up front as the first person with your inauguration. Uh, that's the advantage you have here with your mic. And I would like to uh, ask uh, Noortje to take over for the uh, first session. Noortje. Thank you. Um, 
Well, welcome to the first session of three in which we investigate the cooperation between um, industry, the clinic, and academia. And this session is uh, themed uh, neurology. So we'll, uh, there will be three talks, one from industry, one from academia, one from uh, um, uh, the clinic on uh, neurology and neuroscience. And I would like to invite the first speaker uh, to the, to the cathedral here. And that will be uh, Professor Cyril Pennert, who is Professor in Cognitive, Systems, uh, Cognitive and Systems Neuroscience at the University of Amsterdam. And the title of his talk is shown here, From the Foundations of Brain and Mind to the Computational Models and Neurotechnology. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Rob. The audio is OK. Uh, yeah. Uh, and thanks for uh, the organizers for inviting me, Noortje, and uh, congratulations to Martin for the beautiful day, <laughs> also outside, but uh, especially for your inauguration. Very nice, festive activity. Um, right, yeah, so uh, as the title says, I'd like to take you through um, <clears throat> the fundamentals of neuroscience and how they speak also to the development of novel technologies, in particular to treat uh, brain disorders and uh, argue that uh, both are needed, the, f the foundations as well as uh, the applied side. Um, <clears throat> this is our group. Uh, I work at the University of Amsterdam in a, the group named Cognitive and Systems Neurosciences, Rob said. And um, yeah, it's, it, it's a very nice interdisciplinary group with uh, computational modelers, computational people, experimentalists who mainly work on uh, animal models. Um, recently also uh, human research with um, uh, brain imaging um, and um, uh, technology branches such as optogenetics and the application to disease models. Um, <coughs> um, first a little bit um, about the emerging field of neurotechnology. What do we have there in the range of brain disorders? Impossible to cover everything. Uh, I'd like to illustrate why we need also um, better fundamental understanding of brain and mind to get to uh, better cures for, for instance, uh, perception disorders or disorders of consciousness. Um, a little bit on computer models of perception. So how are the ideas and the concepts tested by simulations and how carried on to experiments. And finally, a little bit about our work on stroke and hemineglect. Um, uh, which also happens in the context of NeuroTechNL, a, a consortium uh, where also people here at uh, Eindhoven uh, participate in. Um, so like I said, it, it's very hard to give an overview of neurotechnology in general, uh, but we do see uh, already the, the emergence of very successful techniques like cochlear implants, which are applied worldwide now, and which basically um, uh, rest on the insertion of electrodes into the cochlea in uh, hearing impaired people, um, where uh, basically, uh, basically the hair cells are being uh, stimulated, um, and then uh, the hair cells are supposed to be intact. There's still transmission through the acoustic nerve possible, but this is widely implied um, in, in the order of hundreds of thousands of patients uh, each year. Um, a bit more recent development is the retinal implant, where we see the implementation of, of chips, uh, light-sensitive chips, um, for instance, just below the retina, such that <coughs> in the case of a retinal degeneration, um, there's still a possibility for those chips to stimulate uh, the underlying nerve tissue, either uh, ganglion cells which project to the brain, or uh, optic nerve, and <coughs> in that way uh, it's still possible to um, uh, give people a, a rough sense of uh, central vision. Um, <coughs> not quite the same as, as full-blown vision with high accuracy, uh, but it helps to, uh, to get people uh, going again if they're uh, uh, threatened to become fully blind. Um, this is also uh, followed up in, in the Netherlands, for instance, by my colleague uh, Pieter Rolfsma at the Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience, who works on the visual cortex to stimulate that part in case the eye is, is lost <coughs> or the uh, transmission to the brain is lost. On the lower left you find uh, models of epilepsy. Uh, this is work uh, in e-brains, that's um, uh, an infrastructure uh, emerging in Europe as a follow-up to the Human Brain Project. In the work of Victor Yersa, for instance, in Marseille, um, uh, work is being done to make um, personalized models of epileptic brains. 
Um, and these are personalized, so it means that they're specific to individuals with epilepsy. And they're able to, to simulate the propagation of an epileptic seizure. Uh, once you have enough data, which is MRI scans, uh, but also connectivity data, uh, with EEG uh, recordings, for instance, or MEG, um, preferably with depth electrodes in the patient to more accurately uh, localize um, uh, the sources of uh, electrical signals as a seizure uh, starts to develop. <clears throat> this is becoming already applied to the stage where the surgeon can be advised to uh, look for particular places um, assisted by this uh, simulation technology. So, of course, the, the surgeon is not replaced, but advised. Um, on the lower right, we have um, an instance of uh, paralysis. Um, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis um, is being addressed by Nick Ramsey in Utrecht, for instance. Uh, but also other efforts are being made when the patient gets fully paralyzed to uh, implant a brain-machine interface. And the idea is to record brain signals uh, which uh, correspond to particular willed actions of the patient, like move the cursor here and here, uh, but also uh, speaking. Uh, that is the derivation of electrophysiological signals from the brain. Uh, for instance, in the gamma range, that is about 40, 50 hertz oscillations, uh, which can be translated into finger movements or, uh, in some cases, even words. And then um, <clears throat> those signals are being converted with the help of uh, algorithms uh, into speech or uh, uh, like uh, cursor movements. Um, so that's also uh, taking, uh, taking off, really. Um, like I said, yeah, there's an effort in Europe uh, originating from the Human Brain Project, which drives at the establishment of a bigger digital research infrastructure across Europe, um, spread out across various centers with different specializations, basically to catalyze brain research. A little bit in the spirit of uh, CERN, uh, the particle physics accelerator in the upper right, but then not uh, as a physics instrument, but rather uh, as, a, as a collection of digital tools, uh, high-performance computing, supercomputers, etc., with also a strong clinical branch. Uh, but there's a recognition that also to drive the technology forward, you need to understand better how the brain works. Uh, for that, you need to measure brain activity, not only at the EEG level, that is at the scalp, the growth signals, uh, but also at the cell level. So what are the cells doing? What is the role of interneurons of very particular cell types, which can be addressed by causal interference? For instance, optogenetics is a tool, a molecular tool by which light is used to activate or inactivate particular brain cell types or circuits or uh, whole brain areas. And then computer models are needed to, yeah, basically to, to gauge our understanding of the process. Like Richard Feynman said, uh, yeah, uh, you know, basically, you, yeah, in order to understand something, I have to build it, uh, or in the case of the brain, uh, to simulate it and then show that the concept really works. Um, so now, yeah, uh, other disorders are coming into view. Alzheimer's is still very difficult, a long shot. It's degeneration all over the place. Parkinson has its uh, DBS um, treatment component in addition to the pharmacology. So deep brain stimulation is now also widely used. And uh, blindness is becoming uh, treatable. Um, <clears throat> what we try to set up also for the Netherlands as a complement to the European e-brains structure is um, this kind of circuit in yellow orange arrows where we start with uh, patient data, you supplement it with life science data, so for instance from animal models with artificial intelligence tools, um, build data collections in a fair manner that is um, findable, accessible, um, interoperable, reproducible, etc. So that a lot of people across Europe and the world can work with that. Um, build then uh, brain models and do simulations to validate uh, the ideas. Um, and hence develop uh, that stream into neurotechnology, which is, for instance, the development of neuromorphic computing. Those are not ordinary computer chips, but rather neuron-like computing elements. So basically, um, 
electronic uh, circuits that mimic neurons and by which you can, by doing that in parallel, you can uh, often approximate uh, brain functions in a way. Um, uh, that then leads also to uh, the um, control of um, microfabricated systems, either electrodes that record brain signals or uh, devices to uh, write to the brain, to manipulate brain activity, uh, for instance by light, like I said, but also electrical stimulation, which is the standard. Uh, here also in Eindhoven, for instance, Juri van den Burgt, but also in Twente and Groningen, uh, a lot of people are working to, on the nanoscale to work with materials to, to, yeah, to make that kind of small circuit matter uh, more intelligent. And then finally, we need to apply that to the brain. Here you have uh, an example of the, uh, the, the visual cortex implant of uh, Rulsema, where uh, around a thousand electrodes can be implanted to both record from brain cells, uh, but also to stimulate. It's becoming feasible to, to give people that were previously totally blind with the camera a, a kind of rough image, but this is hopefully improving as the number of stimulation sites uh, will increase. Um, so yeah, a little bit about um, uh, the fundamentals. If we want to eventually cure people with perceptual disorders, uh, not particularly the, the man with the amputated leg over here, you also have to understand uh, the basis of perception. I'd like to be brief about this, but basically the, the question here is where is the sensation of cold water happening? Uh, the, the leg is artificial, there are no sensors in the foot, but still you see the man jumping up and, and, and giggling perhaps, having this funny sensation. Um, and, uh, and also in the rotating snake's case, you might think, well, is that now? Where is the rotation? Uh, some people don't see it. I see it very much if I look at it, the spirals, especially around your, the point where you foveate, where your gaze is at. And yeah, is that, uh, you know, where is the rotation? It's a simple question, right? Uh, Martin, do you have an answer, perhaps? Where is the rotation? Yeah, or somebody else? I should. It's made up, right? It's, it's made up, yeah, 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 yeah. But where is it, yeah? Uh, it's not on the screen, right? That's, yeah, you can measure that. There's no physical movement on the screen. So it's not on the screen. Most people say, well, it's in the brain then, right? But. Uh, it's also difficult, uh, just pre purely reasoning from materialism with, you know, um, uh, uh, bounding every phenomenon to a place is, is difficult because if a surgeon opens up the skull, he doesn't find rotating snakes in your head. At least I hope not. Um, so rather the idea is to, yeah, to say, well, the, the brain contains the vehicle, uh, the neurons who generate this illusory phenomenon. But it's really a representation that is neither yeah, inside the brain, it's sort of a product by the brain, if you will, uh, projected to the outside, and that's what we experience. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, here we talk a little bit about properties of conscious experience, of perception. Um, the time is lacking to take you through all of this, but there are properties of like uh, different senses, different modalities that we experience, all very different qualitative richness. We experience ourselves as being situated, like you, you sit in this room, there's not a single stimulus alone that you are aware of, but rather a stimulus in the context. And so there are properties of integration, of how you put the senses together, the ventriloquist uh, uh, effect where sound and vision are also merged into a common experience. Uh, where there's a source attribution, dynamic sensibility that, that relates to that Necker cube, right? You can switch of how you see the cube exactly, but then the switching also has some stability, some sluggishness to it. Most importantly, uh, interpretation is, is there, that, that we basically have a brain that um, doesn't generate uh, representations of experiences of itself, but rather uh, of something else than itself, that is called intentionality. Um, so you do get into uh, philosophy even. Um, yeah, if we ask, well, uh, how is that interpretation happening in, in perception uh, with a bunch of neurons, then yeah, one view is to say, well, basically the brain generates a copy. It just has to absorb the sensory information and that has to code it in, in the way of a sort of copy form and then you have it. But um, if you really look at how the nerve, nervous system works and how the brain works, we already talked about the vagus nerve, then we see that all the sensory information comes to the brain by action potentials, by electrical impulses, which pretty much look the same for all these different senses, whether it's vision or hearing. 
And there's no intrinsic mechanism to the brain to say, well, this action potential is about vision or about color, and the other one is about sound. So interpretation really has to happen at, at the level of the brain. Huh? The middle part shows a neural network, um, just illustrating that, yeah, what we interpret the inputs and outputs to the network to be, uh, also in artificial intelligence, is in a way arbitrary. These are just numbers, and we can interpret the inputs and outputs, but the neural network itself cannot. Um, so here, um, the upshot is, is really that the brain has to create its own interpretation, and uh, a concept of simply copying the sensory information and reading it out is, is not working. Uh, there's an approach which goes back to Kant and uh, Helmholtz also that says, well, this interpretation um, could happen by saying um, that, yeah, we do not have so much direct access to world items, uh, to real objects like the horse, um, but we have to infer, uh, basically, from our sensory inputs what they are about. And this could happen roughly in the cortex, in our uh, big uh, giant structure below the skull, in a hierarchy of layers of cells. So there are uh, lower visual areas, for instance, and higher. The idea here in predictive coding is that uh, you basically um, create a cycling of predictions that are made by the brain. So the brain is trying to predict what causes the sensory inputs to arise. And then based on the comparison of actual input from the horse, to the predictions, you can compute errors, and based on the errors, you can improve your inferences or your representations, uh, but also learn uh, from that. It's an idea that dates back to Helmholtz, that's 19th century, uh, but this is now worked out in computer models, and we uh, do our best to make them also more uh, brain-like, so how this process of prediction works. You basically see the eye there below the brain, and the idea is that through the LGN, then uh, there's also the hierarchy in the visual cortex that does this. It's a paradigm that quickly um, gains um, adherence and support. Um, one um, uh, model is shown here by Matthias Bruchlacher in the lab. He basically built a model that says, well, can we make a model uh, recognize uh, a specific image of an object, but can you then also make the network recognize the identity of the object as an invariant. So uh, you can look at the apple, it sort of rolls on, it moves on. You can recognize that it's still the same apple as it rolls on. Uh, but there's also a specific image of, of that would be important for grabbing the apple, actually. Those are two streams in the brain that we also need to furnish in order for things to work in our action system. And basically what he shows is that, yes, with this predictive processing schedule, you can uh, look at the moving uh, handwritten digit 5. It, it moves through the image. The picture below is, is a kind of distributed neural representation at a low level, so lower in the visual cortex of how that is processed. Uh, but as the image shifts, uh, your brain cells are, there are different brain cells activated all the time. The propagation is to a higher area in the very high area at the bottom here, area 4. There you see that um, suddenly now all the, only the, the same cells are being activated all the time, even though the digit is moving uh, across the visual field. And that means that you achieve invariance. It basically means that, yes, this is a model that can sort of generatively predict what the image was, that it was a handwritten digit 5, uh, but also that it stays constant despite the uh, translation to the field. It also works for rotations, etc. I'm um, going to skip this, um, I'm going to end, I think, right, um, by um, briefly pointing to um, how we apply this kind of knowledge for neurotechnology. Um, and that is an application built by Humberto Olchez in the lab, Eric Dijkema and Medina Husic. In an animal model, we now say, well, we basically um, uh, attach a neuromorphic chip. The neuromorphic chip reads out uh, brain signals, in this case, V1 is, is this lower visual area. And normally, um, a brain circuit in between the visual cortex and the motor circuits would mediate the conversion of visual input into motor actions. That happens, the motor actions are initiated, for instance, by ALM. Those are yeah, particular ar areas of the rodent for initiating, for instance, licking movements to get reward. But if an area in between is lesioned, then we try to replace it, at least partially by this neuromorphic chip that converts 
read in brain signals into uh, stimulation patterns writing to the brain. In that way, we hope to create a not so much a brain machine interface, but a brain to brain uh, interface. Um, and that is uh, then taken to an animal model of hemi neglect. This is a disorder where people, uh, for instance, by a stroke in the right parietal cortex, lose a vision for the, for the other side, the left side of the visual field. And they cannot act on this, they cannot see it, they're, they're often not conscious. So if you ask them, well, please bisect the lines there over there, they only do it for half of their visual field. And that's what we're trying to reproduce and uh, restore. Um, yeah, so uh, I think to, I'd, I'd like to leave it at that. General remarks on neurotechnology to illustrate how it is emerging, but that we also need the fundamental knowledge to advance. And our approach is on this predictive processing, uh, representationalist approaches. The advancements in computer models are important to test the ideas and to bring it further to technology. And this is then done partly by the neuromorphic chips. Um, thanks for your attention. Yeah. This was a microphone as well. Yeah. <laughs> we can use this for questions of the yeah. audience. Thank you for a very nice presentation. Yeah. Um, um, there's room for some questions from the audience. Are there any? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your interesting talk. As a uh, cell biologist by training, I see a lot of hardware uh, used to regenerate, and Karma was telling about the regenerative medicine uh, replacement of an uh, in the body developed uh, kidney. Do you think that we could also use like these in body cell based approaches for within neurology instead neurology, of neurology? Yeah. yeah. Uh, difficult, yeah. yeah. Uh, on the one hand, it's difficult because um, uh, new cells forming, neurogenesis does happen, but not uh, in so many places, especially not in the human brain. Uh, another problem is, of course, to get the wiring right. Uh, this has been a traditional problem in Parkinson's disease where people succeeded in implanting dopaminergic cells, um, but then to make them grow in the right direction is still a problem. Uh, but there are indeed uh, um, uh, signaling approaches where you try to guide the axon growth in the right direction. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it should certainly be pursued. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> well, thank you very much for an interesting talk. I was just wondering, uh, the question is a bit philosophical in nature. Do you think that the progress of what you're doing uh, the modeling and the experimental psychological work that you're doing, is it going to dramatically change the classical teaching that a particular area of the human cortex is responsible for a particular interpretation or a particular perception or a particular function? Hmm. Are we going to lose that completely or do you still think that, hmm. let's say, functional neuroanatomy will stand? Yeah, uh, very good question, very timely question, because there are a lot of developments. <clears throat> uh, one development on the cortex is to recognize how much it is interconnected. Um, so as opposed to saying, well, visual cortex is just visual cortex, because it receives uh, the appropriate thalamic input deriving from the retina, we now recognize that about 98% of the fibers come from within the cortex, only 2% comes from the thalamus. Uh, so the cortex primarily talks to itself, and what you see, I think, is a huge interaction. Uh, we study this by finding, for instance, auditory responsive neurons in the visual cortex. And these, these, these can be cells which do not respond to visual stimuli, but they respond to hearing. And that we interpret as, as a way of the modalities to interact, perhaps also in, in a predictive way. What you also see is a huge influence of the motor system on the sensory systems. So, uh, for instance, we, we think that relates also to interpretation. Uh, so, like, if, if you make a turn uh, with your head, then you have a particular... Your brain creates an expectation of what will be out there. Um, so, so, it's very important to have this so-called inference copy back to the sensory systems and say, well, this is according to expectation, there's no error or there is some surprise, uh, and that's, that's worth examining. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think that's the development, yeah, to recognize a huge interaction. At the same time, I have to say, we 
did the optogenetics on the visual cortex and inactivated it and then tested is that important for uh, the rodent to detect visual change or maybe also auditory change, uh, but only the visual change was affected. And that's classical again. So the, the causality is still intact. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I think if you have time, uh, let's thank Cyril yeah. again, and then we go to the next speaker. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Ja, die heb je straks ook nodig. Oh. Ja. So the next speaker will be Professor Evelyn Carette, who is a uh, clinical professor at Ghent University. Uh, and a clinical research coordinator at Ghent University Hospital. And, um, well, Evelyn, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Next slide should start. Yeah. Good morning, uh, everybody. It's a true honor for me to be here. Thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me today. Um, as Rob said, I'm, uh, I'm part of uh, the Four Brain Research Group, um, which is embedded in the hospital, in Ghent University Hospital at the Neurology Department. And today I would like to um, show you a part of our research, specifically to uh, highlight our specific translational approach that we have uh, for doing our research. And today I will uh, show you uh, how we have a quest for biomarkers uh, for VNS uh, response. But first, I would like to... Uh, yeah, I will leave it like that. I don't know how to... Uh, it's for the video, because I cannot uh, push it, but uh, it doesn't really matter. I would like to set the scene. What is the clinical context of, um, of our research? And our clinical context is about epilepsy. And epilepsy is one of the most common neurological diseases uh, characterized by seizures. Um, and a seizure is a transient occurrence of signs, symptoms that a patient has when there is excessive or synchronous uh, neuronal activity in a certain part of the brain. And depending on what part of the brain, the symptoms can be very different. Fortunately, most of these patients are well treated with the available drugs there is on the market. About two-thirds of patients, their seizures are well treated. Nevertheless, there's one-third of patients um, who have so-called drug-resistant epilepsy, and it's it's very important that these, ah, there is my video of a patient uh, showing uh, the seizure. So it's very important for these patients to be referred to a um, very specific um, center, a center for reference, uh, an, an, uh, a reference center who is helping these patients with continuing uh, seizures. And one of the, one of the four uh, and the largest in Belgium is embedded in our uh, neurology department, is our reference center for refractory epilepsy in Ghent. And it's very important to refer these patients because the chances of a patient with drugs resistant epilepsy to become seizure free trying more drugs are very low. As you can can see here um, on this on this graph, the International League Against Epilepsy actually says that a patient is uh, should be considered drug resistant as soon as he he or she has tried two two different uh, drugs because chances that they will be rendered seizure free trying a third a fourth a fifth drug is is very low so patients are referred to such a specific center such a reference center to find out if alternatives are possible. And the highest chance for a patient to be, become seizure-free is actually by epilepsy surgery, where a very small part of the brain is where the seizure has its onset is being removed. Um, however, of course, not all patients are eligible for surgery. In such a reference center, we often are uh, performing clinical trials with new drugs that come from industry, of course, um, to see if this can help these patients. But if you, if you look at this graph, we see that since the 80s, the number of compounds that are available on the market to treat epilepsy have exponentially grown. Nevertheless, the portion of patients with epilepsy who are refractory to, the, to all the compounds remains actually the same. One third of patients remains refractory. So we need alternatives. And I have the honor to work at Forbrain, where we have a lot of expertise on neuromodulation as an alternative um, treatment for these difficult-to-treat um, patients. 
We could spend a whole day talking about neuromodulation for epilepsy because there's, there's already many forms. There is a way of, as set, being said for Parkinson's, you can try to treat patients with intracranial deep brain stimulation with depth electrodes or cortical electrodes. There is also a, a large involvement in the extracranial way of stimulating the brain for epilepsy with transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, transcranial um, direct current stimulation, um, so the extracranial, and there's also new ways of, of delivering this stimulation. It used to be very, in a dumb way, just performing stimulation, but more and more there is uh, research on closing the loop and really give a specific trigger at a specific timing to perform um, the neurostimulation. But as I said, I could talk, there could be a whole symposium on this. So today I would really like to um, focus on a specific form of neuromodulation for epilepsy being vagus nerve stimulation. Um, uh, and vagus nerve stimulation, as being already said, the vagus nerve is the wandering nerve, so the, the nerve that is actually wandering throughout our body. It's a cranial nerve. It has a lot of connections in the thorax, in the abdomen. It wanders through, and, but it also has many, many connections intracranially. And it is very easy accessible in the neck, so it has it gives us the opportunity to stimulate the brain in a very wide uh, way, broad way, via um, a cuff electrode that is implanted in the neck of the patient, a cuff electrode that is wounded around this wandering nerve, this vagus nerve. Um, this is not a new technique worldwide. There have been 150,000 patients with epilepsy implanted with this technique. Typically, a patient is implanted by the neurosurgeon, then recovers from this surgery, and then over the weeks and months to come, the neurologist is um, uh, changing the parameters and is setting the parameters straight. And it takes up to six months to a year to really evaluate if this treatment is efficient in a patient. So there is not an on-off situation, but there is kind of a modulation of what's happening in the brain and uh, to have an effect on the seizures. But here you see um, that in one out of three of this very difficult to treat patients, we do see a very significant decrease of the seizures in the patient, more than 50%. However, in one third, this is less than 50%, and in one third, we have no effect. So you, you this is the, the first group is a clear group of responders to the treatment, but we unfortunately also have quite a large number of patients who are called non-responders. And from a clinical point of view, and in our clinic, all our patients, we here see a very clear medical need. And as Martin has said this morning, we, this is an identification of a problem that we need um, to tackle from really from in the clinic. And this is an example of um, one of the res or one of the um, problems we want to tackle at for brain coming from this clinical need. And these are all very specific research questions in the field of vagus nerve stimulation. Who are these patients who respond well compared to the non-responders? What is this res responder profile that is so far not, we could not identify this? Are there biomarkers that we could set up front to say you will be a responder and you will not be a responder? What are the optimal stimulation parameters? What is the the, the true mechanism of action, and also there's a whole field um, of research working on how can we make these devices smaller, less obtrusive, and so on. So, for the for the for this top uh, for this day, I would like to focus on that and specifically show you how at Forebrain we are in the very um, very nice situation to, to tackle these questions in a very translational way. So, as I said, we are embedded in. Uh, Ghent University Hospital at the Neurology Department, where we, of course, have a lot of patients, um, but also a lot of infrastructure. Besides the reference center for refractory epilepsy, we are also um, uh, have infrastructure where we can really monitor patients 24-7 with EEG, with video, um, and this gives us a great opportunity to perform our research. And as a very um, nice uh, setup, we have in parallel, we have, whoops, <laughs> in parallel, we have um, our preclinical lab where we actually try to set 
things up very similar to what is happening in the clinic in our, in our animal models, validated animal models for, our, for epilepsy. So we have also this video EG uh, set up and for today we also have VNS work. So we also implant these rats with a very small um, homemade electrodes to implant um, these in the neck of these rats also the vagus nerve with these um, electrodes. We then monitor them just like we monitor our patients at the video EG monitoring. But of course, preclinical research has its, has its benefit because we can do more and we can do more basic research. For instance, um, in this setup, we have uh, also used microdialysis. And microdialysis is a technique where you can infuse a certain liquid in a certain part of the brain. So you implant a rat brain with a probe, you insert a certain liquid, but you can also monitor the liquid um, the, the, the concentrations of neurotransmitters, for instance, in this rat brain, in that structure, over time. And that is exact, sorry, that is exactly what we did in a certain setup where we wanted to see what VNS does on the neurotransmitter level of, um, of a rat and also see how this influences um, the seizures. So here you see the setup that I explained, the microdialysis, so you insert a liquid and then you sample what the liquids uh, of that part of the brain and you see what concentrations um, are, are present. And in this setup we had a sham implanted group of paid animals and a VNS implanted group of animals. So we, we monitor the concentration of the brain liquid, that's so the, the, what's happening in the brain over time. So each block is about 20 minutes. And so we collected this over time. And then in the VNS group, we started VNS stimulation and we looked what concentration changes happened uh, while stimulating. And then you see the P, and the P is actually the pilocarpin that is then being infused in the rat brain, and pilocarpin makes the, the rats having seizures. So we will also look how VNS has protected rats from seizures to occur. And what we actually saw was that when we performed this VNS, in our collections, the noradrenaline, it's a sort of neurotransmitter, the noradrenaline rose throughout uh, by, by, by stimulating with VNS. And more, very much more important was that we saw that the animals that had larger um, uh, increase of noradrenaline were much better protected from having seizures. So here we actually saw that noradrenaline um, showed who were the responders to the VNS treatment. Animals that were having a lower increase of the noradrenaline had worse seizures. So what we wanted to do in our translational approach approach was to see if this noradrenaline um, could be a biomarker in the response of our patients too. Of course, it's quite difficult to implant patients with microdialysis. So in this translational approach, we needed to find an alternative to the microdialysis, but to still show that this translation holds. And we, um, we used a so-called um, cognitive evoked potential because for a P3, uh, P300 of this cognitive um, evoked potential is correlated with the noradrenaline concentration in the brain. What is a, what is a, so for a cognitive evoked potential to evoke a P300, you need a so-called auditory oddball paradigm. What is this? We, you have to imagine that you hear tones that are very frequent, so yeah, to, uh, very frequent tones, and now and then you hear an infrequent tone. So you're listening to tones, um, and all of a sudden there is an infrequent tone, and when you perform EEG while listening to that, your brain will react to that. And if you do this 100 times after one another, and you cut all these tiny pieces of EEG, and you average them, you get to a cognitive evoked potential. And this wave that you see here, the P3 or the P300, or the peak that you see 300 milliseconds after your stimulus, that's your P3. That wave, the amplitude of it, is um, correlated with the noradrenaline concentration in your brain. So what we did to see if this translation holds was that we, we chose uh, in our large population of patients who have been treated long time with VNS, um, 
Um, and we chose 10 patients that were really well responders to the VNS, so the 10 responders, and we chose 10 patients who were non-responders to the VNS. And we looked by performing this auditory oddball paradigm how the P3 looked like. And indeed, we saw a significant difference in our VNS responders that they showed a larger P3 when they were in the on condition of their VNS. This is good to know. It, it, it shows that this translation holds nevertheless for these patients in a retrospective way. We already knew who was a responder and was a non-responder, so it would, be much, it would be much more interesting if this also holds before a VNS treatment is started, because then you could try to stratify but future responders and future non-responders. And that's what we did in this second study where we set up a prospective study. So we collected patients who would get a VNS treatment and um, we followed them up for one year and then looked who is a responder and a non-responder. But in the beginning, we already did our P3 experiments. And when we looked, knowing in the end what if there would be responders or non-responders, we saw that prior to VNS treatment, the P3 amplitude in the VNS off condition, so in a na naive condition, was significantly different for future responders compared to non-responders. And actually in the non-responders, the amplitude was significantly um, higher. So this is this is the this could in fact be a biomarker to before you start VNS treatment to already stratify um, patients to future responders or non-responders. In the field, there has also been a huge uh, way of non uh, of making VNS non-invasive because of course once you implant the implantation has been done and, and the, the patient is implanted. So there is ways, there is companies and there is devices that stimulate your vagus nerve in the neck area through the skin. And in your ear, you have also a branch of your vagus nerve um, in the Simba Conchai of your ear. So there is also devices that are able to stimulate this branch of your um, vagus nerve in your ear, and this could help us to um, work towards prediction and biomarkers, of course. So, at Ghent in Forebrain, we have the, the we go from the bed to the bench to the bed, and I would like I have told you all this way, but I, I must say that once we we are in the clinic, we tend to go back to our bench because now, for instance, we are trying to modulate the locus ceruleus, which is a very important, um, has a very important role in this cascade of VNS and neuroadrenaline, noradrenaline release to opto and chemogenetically try to um, work upon the LC to see how this influences uh, noradrenaline release and how this influences um, our rats to maybe then get back to the clinic and to um, cure our patients. So thank you very much to my colleagues, but also to you for listening. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Evelyn. Um, let's see if there's any questions from the audience. Anyone? Bert? Um, thank you for your uh, very beautiful presentation, your clinical experience. Uh, I think it's, it's well established that uh, vagal nerve stimulation has an anti-seizure effect. Uh, it has been proven in the most refractory patients. It's a last resort uh, treatment. But what is your experience uh, when it comes to a, 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 a disease-modifying effect? What happens if you remove the electrode, uh, stop the, the battery in those patients who became a responder, mm -hmm. had at least 50% seizure reduction. It's always in discussion what it means in these mm -hmm. patients, but what happens? Is then the effect gone or is the disease modified? I tend to believe the disease is not really cured or modified because we really, um, uh, the patients are being followed up and when the, when the battery is nearly end of life, it's very important to, to monitor this and to re-implant these patients. So re-implantation of the device 
is, is necessary. So to my belief, I think we modulate um, the way maybe the threshold is being set uh, in the brain, but I don't think we, we lower the threshold low enough to then stop stop the, the, the stimulation for life. So I think if you are a good responder to VNS, I think it's important to keep this, this, um, to keep this going. And so um, we also see in patients that are doing well that they suddenly do worse, and that, that could be due to the fact that the battery has run empty. So I rather believe it is, it is seizure modifying, but it's not curing a patient from its epilepsy, so it's not curing the, uh, the disease, I would okay. think. Okay. Actually, in the view of time, there's <laughs> not a lot of time. Let's uh, keep your question for the coffee break. Let's uh, thank Evelyn again. Thank you. Okay. And then I would like to ask the next speaker to the front, who is uh, Dr. Jurian Bakker who is the Chief Technology Officer at Inervia Bioelectronics. And he will talk about, um, well, the process of bringing a device to market and what, uh, what is involved in that. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Rob, for uh, the introduction. And uh, Martin, good luck uh, later today. Um, I will not congratulate you already. I want to see it first. Um, thanks for the invitation. And um, I also want to have some time together you know, to talk about uh, the triangle, because I'm not sure I'm being positioned as a representative of industry. I don't feel like that. I've been working for 10 years in Erasmus Medical Center. Um, I'm still doing clinical research, still involved in a lot of academic science. So what is the definition of where to be in a, in a triangle? Is it only the, the company or the person that's paying your salary? Let's have an after pub quiz uh, presentation about it, or discussion. So I will try to shed a little bit of light of uh, what it means to bring an active implantable device into the market at the end, because that's our goal, to, to help patients. And typically, it's a long journey. And uh, I saw from the pub quiz that 90% uh, almost already knew the answer. So at least this talk is for the other 10%. Um, but let's see. I will also use it a little bit as, as going through my CV, because it's a bit of history as well. So it's, it's my view, it's my experience. Well, I have a little bit of conflict of interest, but most of all, I want to highlight my personal mission and also that I developed over years. So I want to contribute to have a significant impact uh, on a significant amount of people. And we can all debate what significant means. The first significant for me means that it's not about, with all the respect, maybe develop a drug or uh, maybe a therapy for someone with a bit of high blood pressure. Of course, it's important, but for me, significant means working with patients, for example, with cancer, people dying, or people for which the quality of life has really reduced to almost zero. The other part, significant means, and I know it, it takes a long time to come to, at the end, to a group of patients. At the beginning, in Erasmus Medical Center, we're working our beep off, um, to treat and help a few patients, but of course we decide to bring it to a larger group. Coming back to Erasmus, so this is my first example. Um, in 2003-2013, so around 10 years I worked there with uh, some, some of, of, of us I see also in the, in the, in the audience, very nice. Um, it's become with, it, it started with a scientific idea, you know, to treat Patients with, with, with tumors in the head and neck area, with heat, with microwaves, combined with radiation, with chemotherapy, it's always a cocktail, so that's the synergy. And you saw, I, I just looked it up, I saw a nice, nice paper about quite a few patients um, being analyzed and being published. In the meantime, there's also a company created, which is called Sentius, and I've seen on the web, so I'm just copying it copying just the information that you can find as well, that there are now developments ongoing. And uh, I wonder, of course, when this uh, product development is finished and when the clinical trials start, if there's clinical trials to be done. But it will take a bit, I think, before this reaches the, the bigger, bigger amount of patients. So 
I don't know, I don't have the numbers for this case, but in my view, quite some millions have been invested from the start. Um, 20 years of uh, product and therapy development, it's not only about ther the products. Um, to become, at the end, uh, get your certificate for going to Europe or to, to the United States. So this is a little bit of uh, the time, and time is uh, relative, as you can see, I think, from this picture. <laughs> I don't see a change. I, I know I lost my, my hair. This person here, I don't know. <laughs> Did you ever have a haircut in between, or still the same? <laughs> okay. Another example, so quite busy slide, so I'll try to guide you through. After my 10 years of experience in the, in the clinic, trying to develop products for a few patients, I decided I want to have a bigger impact. I want to go to the industry at the end to develop products, hopefully in two years, and then go to the market and hundreds of thousands of patients benefited from it. But I learned it took quite some more years, and also the end result was maybe not as I hoped. So on the left you can see that from Philips, basically at the time, and I'm not even sure when they started, but they worked on thin film technology to make miniaturized electrodes for stimulating in the brain, but also recording in the brain. So deep brain stimulation for Parkinson is one of the patient groups that this was targeted for. Um, and there was a startup created, a spin-off from, from Philips, which called, was called Sapiens. Um, and I have the pleasure to work on the product development there. So what you see here is a very enlarged, but it's, a, it's a electronics, uh, integrated ASICs that were placed on top of the head, very small, um, that were able to switch and stimulate from, from towards 40 electrodes in the brain. So do stimulation and recording. We tested this concept in the Amsterdam Medical Center in eight patients, showed the benefit of having more electrodes, having the benefit of doing the recordings. And this was very successful in the sense that it raised a lot of attention. We were acquired by Medtronic, which is the, the biggest medical, medical device company worldwide. And we did the integration of this technology into their platforms. And you can see me on the right um, in Minneapolis in the United States, in PRL, which is a research lab for human cadavers, but also a lot of animals. Here the surgical room is, is empty. Uh, I'm the only one ex and, and an animal doing stimulation recording with this equipment and this, this technology in the sheep, and the results were remarkable. Still, there were reasons why not to continue with this. And I won't go into much detail, but it was quite young technology, uh, very expensive. Um, those leads typically have a cost price, normal leads, that are implanted today of $300. This was something that is orders of magnitude beyond. So the, the market, I would say, was not ready at the time. Still, the software that we developed in the time, to, uh, treatment planning software, um, to also predict the, the side effects based on the MRI, based on the placement of the leads, um, are still being marketed. So I still have some impact, a little bit contributed, uh, to uh, today's patient. The other example, um, also here in Eindhoven, um, is on spinal cord injury. So people that have an injury that cannot walk again, but walking is not the most, most important for those patients. It started way, way back already in preclinical -pre uh, research, but uh, at least before 2008. Um, also in Lausanne, where Gr Professor Ricard Coutin was doing a lot of research on, on, um, on rodents, later on also on monkeys, bringing that to, to patients at the end. So we started in 2014 um, to build in, in Eindhoven a, a team that is going to do the, the product development. And we worked there for five years, um, because it started in 2014, sorry, in, in, uh, in Lausanne, then we moved and, and started in 2016 in the Netherlands. Five years later, um, we developed a product platform for doing stimulation in the spinal cord, uh, with 16 electrodes, and also in a closed-loop way. So we had a body-worn device that is collecting data from, for example, motion sensors or blood pressure sensors, um, because at the end, this technology was more or less finished. Um, there was an IPO, so the, the company went to the stock exchange um, to raise money, more money for bringing the, that product into the next phase, into the clinic. And three weeks ago, the first IBG, so the implantable pulse generator, was implanted in the first patient. 
a, spin, a patient with a spinal cord injury, but not for walking, we, because we did already the studies that walking that works, that's nice, but it's not the most important for a large group of patients. It's about blood pressure control. So um, this was being uh, announced, and this is blood pressure control where um, people faint basically after their injury if they stand. So they cannot sit or stand because they faint because of the blood pressure drop. And um, I believe this patient was uh, already in bed for almost a year, just laying flat. Well, you can look up some of those images, or sorry, the, 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 the web pages, because there are fantastic uh, movies about mobility, people walking again, of course with crutches or with walkers, but also on the blood pressure, people standing again and, and making steps. All right, then something that's more for me today. Um, I'm working for InBrain. In, uh, it's a company in, uh, in Barcelona. It has a daughter company which is called Innervia. Very high level, InBrain focuses on brain. Innervia focuses on, on nerves, peripheral nerves, vagus nerve. Um, and we try to do a bit the same as we did before in other companies, uh, but with a new material, which is called graphene. Um, Maybe it's quite new still, but uh, I think in a few years you will all find that your batteries and solar panels will con contain graphene, because it is a very unique material um, that was invented uh, many, many years ago. Um, a Nobel Prize has been won you know, by those two gentlemen uh, in Manchester, which we collaborate with. So after this invention and after this Nobel Prize, a one billion project, one billion project in Europe has been started in the last 10 years on a lot of projects like solar panels, electronics, battery technology, but also medical applications. And one of them is ICN2, which is a nanotechnology institute in Barcelona, and they developed this graphene into electrodes, electrodes for neural interfaces, which has unique properties. Those properties and those electrodes and the, and, and the, and the preclinical use of that, um, for example, for epilepsy, uh, to, me to measure epileptic events in, uh, in, a, in a very unique way with infraslow uh, waves um, has, been, has been demonstrated and now it's the task up to industry to come up with products that can be used in, uh, in, in humans. So what is this technology about? Well, first of all, it's a thin film technology. So it's wafer based. It's how, how ASICs are being made. It's an automated process. Um, that means no manual soldering of electrodes as you showed an electrode, um, which I know is wrapped around a nerve of 0.25 millimeters diameter. Imagine you want to have an electrode array that you need to solder manually. It's impossible. So you need to go to new technologies, high density electrodes, flexible, uh, needs to conform to the anatomy. Um, it's very, very thin. And of course, it has these graphene layers. Well, we have some indications where we target on. One of this is, uh, is again Parkinson's disease. Why? Because the, the current implants are still very bulky. So big, big IBGs with big batteries, with w wires that needs to be tunneled, um, that erode over time, that causes a lot of uh, rejection of patients. Um, and it's not very centric, patient-centric uh, oriented in the design. So we use those thin films, um, high density electrode arrays, to at the end build thin films um, for, for cortical mapping, for uh, tumor resection, for epileptic uh, uh, seizure uh, areas, but also for deep brain stimulation. So this is an example. On the left you see the today's electrode size of uh, deep brain stimulators. There's uh, three big, big players on the market that provide those uh, devices. And on the right you see uh, an impression of the, the sizes and the densities that we can already make today. So this is a, a view of how this platform could look like, because during the years we also learned that it's not only about deep brain stimulation, it's also about measuring, for example, local field potentials, but also on the cortex. It seems to be very important to, to close the loop for those uh, treatment modalities. So here you see a representation of more like a cochlear device, so a small device under the skin with maybe an earpiece for, for processing, for wireless communication, for uh, powering. But there's quite some challenges to do. So, miniaturization, that's one. We think we can do that with those nice tiny electrodes. That also reduces a lot of less power. 
But this encapsulation in the body, because it needs to stay there for many, many years without being destroyed by the body itself, it's very important. Well, then there are things that also I know that the, the University of uh, Technical University of Eindhoven is working on. So wireless charging, wireless communication, is extremely important to make it small and efficient. Of course, the software. So last last slide is these long term, long timelines, huge amount of investments before you can make any money. Uh, at the end, also companies want to make money. Um, so how can we accelerate this? And uh, I think there's no single answer, so let's have a chat later on this. Um, but it needs to come from the development, it needs to come from preclinical, also on the market approval side. I think if we all work together and closer, that means already with preclinical, maybe develop that a little bit further such that the development can take that earlier on. And also the development starts to collaborate with preclinical in early phase, start to collaborate with market. Uh, approval agencies like the FDA and content authorities in, in Europe, I think there's a lot to gain. And then, of course, the technology. But I think the technology is not a problem. That's it. Okay, thank you, Jorian. I think there could be room for one small question. Yeah, so Wart asks how much faster we could do this. Yeah. I think if you start a change now, then you will not have a gain. But I think we need to think about the future of how we do those things. So if we now work about platforms, and we can use those existing platforms that have been maybe approved for other indications, mm -hmm. and that are versatile enough, maybe for this vagus nerve research, it can already be used. So then it depends at the end not on the platform development and on setting up companies and quality systems and the safety of the device, but to really use it for therapy development. And then maybe you need, still need to do a, uh, a long clinical trial of, let's say, two years to prove the, not only the safety, but mostly the effectiveness of the new therapy. And I cannot really put a number, but I hope that the 20 can become 10. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, then I would like to invite the speakers uh, for the round table discussion. So please take seats on the chairs there. Okay. Yeah, so, so we can sit as well, Bert. We have uh, 10 minutes to solve this whole problem. <laughs> <laughs> When I first saw the, uh, the network approach in the functional MRI in the brain, we thought of these networks as a kind of static, uh, environable, topographic entities, and we know now that they are very dynamic. There's a flow of information processing, vice versa. I think the triangle cooperation is a kind of network uh, that should be very dynamic, and maybe the whole platform idea is a kind of dynamic way of uh, cooperating. But still, we, we have um, um, derived some statements here based on, on your work, based on your abstracts. Um, let's, let's see whether we can find some steps further in cooperation. First, the academia, that's the statement for Professor Pennatz. Um, we know that uh, computer models have their own life, their own truths. They can be very powerful, generating uh, a lot of theoretical information. But is there a gap to be bridged towards clinical practice, for example, because you want this? The first sentence in your abstract is, uh, we want to make an impact on the life of many patients with uh, neurological disease. Could you comment right. on this? Uh, yeah, indeed, there, I think there are multiple dimensions being worked on, the number of neurons, uh, but also the cognitive, cognitive capacities or functions that can be simulated, um, the biological realism, so how close are you actually going from artificial neural networks to more brain-like uh, function. Um, but yeah, if you ask about the clinic, um, I think one important development we see is, is that the 
models which have been largely generic um, can more and more uh, incorporate details from individual patients. Um, so that you could say, I'm, I'm not modeling epilepsy in general, but I'm taking patient X with such and such um, uh, brain parameters, um, sizes, physiological properties of um, the pathways being studied, the brain areas. And then indeed, uh, such as I briefly showed for uh, Victor Yersa's lab, model an individual patient and make predictions of um, clinical usefulness. Uh, so be able to say, well, according to this model, um, the target um, of the surgeon might not be totally within hippocampal area CA3, but maybe uh, CA1. And that can advise the surgeon to um, yeah, yeah, maybe modify the strategy uh, or not. Of course, these are all uh, subjective decisions. But I, th I think we're going to see that personalized approach in more disease areas. Um, also for DBS, I think, the brain stimulation, uh, we see a widening into um, obsessive compulsive disorders, depression, and yeah, how you stimulate, uh, where exactly and with what frequency of pulses and how strong, also depends on biophysical model, uh, modeling the tissue. And um, that, that, again, is, is sometimes very uh, patient-specific. Uh, also for the closed-loop stimulations, that could be, could be an important development, yeah. So, yeah, uh, the short answer is uh, what clinical industrial interactions. Yeah, I think that the clinic can deliver all these individual patient data, um, and the industry can also benefit from it by incorporating it, I think. Yeah. Dr. Bakker, Professor Karet, could you... I Add think the, the personalization of, of, of um, is possible. Also with neurostimulation, we are trying to implement that because even a non-invasive approach of neurostimulation in a, in a certain brain with, with, with not only structure but functional can be, yeah, you can perform the same stimulation, in a, but it's in a different brain, so it could have a different effect. So the personalization of, of these specific treatments, I think, is, is indeed quite important and then you need of course a platform that is um, communicating with the device that is being delivered by the industry that is allowing you that to uh, to do so okay dr bakker no no, no we proceed yeah we, we i cannot agree time. more <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, to, to the second uh, statement uh, just with an eye on the uh, the, the clock um, well, this is something that you recognize, and, and in your presentation you had this whole interaction from bench to bed, uh, which I wondered, um, is that deliberately or is this the, the pragmatic uh, cause of events? Because you find a treatment in last resort and it seems to work, why, you don't know. So you hunt for biomarkers then, mm -hmm. and you uh, are forced to go to the bench on the bed, uh, or, um, or is there a possibility of another more rational approach in developing more neurotechnology, not as a last resort, but as a serious treatment alternative for pharmacological treatment? I think it's a serious um, alternative to pharmacological treatment. And I think I also mentioned that we should not put patients for years and years in searching for, um, for drugs, um, but we should take it earlier on. And I think if we would have a good strategy of defining who is the patient who would benefit the most from a more technological uh, treatment, um, then this would be more accepted and I think we already gained some some years usually I think usually the VNS or the DBS was really very experimental kind of uh, last resort for a patient but I think we are getting closer and yeah as we are still having um, not everybody seems to be a responder so if we could um, indeed find the, 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 the good biomarkers that we could put in again in a personalized way different um, different characteristics of a patient, for instance, the P3, but also we, have, we are looking into more to that, so that you, your, your, your chances of being a responder become much higher. I think you will immediately also get more acceptance 
for a, for a, a technical, te technological uh, therapy if, the, if you see that um, you, you, you implant respond only respo or most responders, then your efficacy will, will be higher. And, and then I think technology, and I think it's already getting there more than, than in the past, will be m more in a treatment option early on. Um, and not just in the end going to university hospital and doing something very experimental. No, I think, and, and yeah, the better we can stratify a good candidate for a certain type of neurostimulation, because I now highlighted VNS, but we have many more, and so we, we are actually looking for the optimal treatment for a patient as early on as possible, and the better your biomarkers are to, to direct a patient to the, the best fitting therapy, will, I think, um, make it more accepted in the field and it will not be a last resort anymore. That's how I think we could yeah. make some progress you, there. <coughs> on the computational side, then the computational neuroscience might also me, need to be directed more towards biomarkers. That could that mean something in the clinic. Yeah, yeah, right? indeed. Yeah. Uh, one has to move from biomarkers to causal mechanisms, I think, mm -hmm. yeah. and see if the biomarkers are merely correlative or have a act as a causal factor in the process. Like you mentioned, noradrenaline mm -hmm. uh, in epilepsy, uh, for which computational modeling is important. Of course, they remain models uh, to always to be validated. Uh, but that's why interventional approaches like optogenetics are mm -hmm. so important. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, the locus ceruleus could be an example. Uh, but there you really um, dissect the system uh, causally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, OK. So, uh, Just. Two minutes left uh, <laughs> for the third speaker, who actually uh, dedicated his whole presentation on this uh, statement. So I think you already answered it. <laughs> uh, but I give you the opportunity to. Uh, yeah, I will. I will give one example that maybe is highlighting this: how you could do it. Um, one of our recent uh, collaborations is a collaboration with Merck, which is a pharmaceutical company, uh, quite a big one. Um, and it means that a pharmaceutical company that has a lot of drugs in the market that understands the disease models, um, they're collaborating now with neuromodulation companies to, to look for the synergetic, uh, synergistic cocktail, basically, similar as with, with oncology, where you cannot only give drugs or radiation um, or heat. And you need to have an understanding of the disease, and you need to collaborate together. And these are really different angles. Everyone is bringing their own expertise. And if you do that early on, instead of 10 years of technology development, and then bringing that to a clinical, clinical therapy development, and then maybe going back because maybe you learned that it's not working, or it has certain side effects. So doing this early on from, usually, you know, from computer models to, to small animal models, to larger animals, to humans, uh, because we all know that if you bring something new into the clinic and you want to include 50 patients, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort of uh, everyone. So that is a very s slow le learning curve. So we need to find other ways to, to do things in parallel. Yeah. I think there is a, a slow approach fr from the neurotechnical companies to the pharmaceutical companies, the electroceutical uh, approach, which is, I think, very hopeful. It's hopeful, but it's a long road because it's these are really road. different worlds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a long. Road. I wish to uh, thank the audience for uh, the participation and the excellent faculty for not only doing uh, excellent presentation but being in time as well, which is quite important <laughs> today. Well. Thank you all. <laughs> yeah.